Hello, my name is Edward Sonino. This video is on how to prevent recessions and high unemployment forever. QE Finance tax rebates are the solution. Months into the 1972 presidential campaign, with the economy weak, unemployment fairly high, poverty on the rise, and civil discontent simmering, Senator George McGovern, the progressive Democrat opposing Richard Nixon's re-election bid, suddenly promised that if elected, he would send a $1,000 check to every man, woman, and child in order to get the economy rolling. That promise was considered demag demagogic pandering by a desperate candidate who was trailing badly in the polls, a veritably preposterous idea. $1,000 in 1972 was the equivalent of $10,000 today. I remember mentioning McGovern's proposal to my father and ridiculing it. If the world were so simple that governments could just print money and hand out $1,000 to every citizen at any time and multiple times, then poverty, recessions, and unemployment would be forever eliminated. And there would be no inflation. It would be so easy. But surely, that's not the real world. Clearly, when it came to economics, George McGovern was an ignoramus. At the time, I was in law school, but had started investing some of my parents' savings in the stock market for a few years while reading the financial pages with great interest, especially opinion pieces in the Wall Street Journal by famous economists. Economics was not a settled science, it still isn't, and their fierce disagreements were stimulating. Years later, starting in 1980 as an economic forecaster and portfolio manager, I ended up having rewarding and at times argumentative correspondences with many top economists, such as Milton Friedman, James Tobin, Franco Modigliani, Alan Meltzer, and Paul Volcker when he was chairman of the Federal Reserve, as well as, as with the leading conservative intellectual Irving Kristol. In 1985 and 1986, the Wall Street Journal published two of my opinion pieces, No Addiction to Foreign Capital and Fed Tightness Boosts Borrowing, which both went against the Fed's conventional economic wisdoms and remain relevant today. My father was a successful entrepreneur, but did not know much about economics or the stock market. That is the case generally, since business and economics are completely distinct subject matters. Most businessmen, in fact, rely on economists for economic forecasts in order to optimally plan their investments and production plans. By the way, it turns out that most economists have mediocre forecasting records, including those at the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, and the European Central Bank, which explains a lot. My father reacted by nodding in an understated way, clearly not as convinced as I was that McGovern was a crazy dreamer. I was sort of disappointed by his tepid agreement. But after all, I was not an economist, so my father was entitled not to be fully persuaded by my arguments. Still, I thought that printing money and sending it directly to citizens in order to stimulate the economy and thereby reduce unemployment and poverty was obviously a truly naive idea. It couldn't possibly work, and it would have severely it would have severely negative side effects such as high inflation and a diminished worth ethic. Otherwise, it would be standard economic policy. As the saying goes, you can't legislate prosperity. And governments don't create wealth. The free enterprise economy does. Otherwise, those banana republics wouldn't be banana republics, but prosperous nations. Furthermore, such policy could easily end up being abused by demagogic politicians doling out thousands of dollars to citizens every other month instead of only once in a while during recessions. Unsurprisingly, McGovern's $1,000 promise definitively torpedoed his campaign. He lost by a landslide. As Americans concluded, he was a non-realist, populist dreamer. What does all that have to do with today? We have similar economic conditions, a weak economy after two years of deep recession, lingering unemployment after years of very high unemployment, increasing poverty, and simmering civil discontent. We urgently need to find a way to get the economy growing strongly. Today, every economist acknowledges that the reason the economy is sluggish is that personal consumption is low relative to our productive capacity.
The crucial question that must be answered is the following. Why is personal consumption low? The answer, because personal income is low, in part due to persistently high real unemployment of around 9%, which includes discouraged workers no longer act actively seeking jobs and part-time workers seeking full-time jobs. And in part due to excess productive capacity which limits wage increases. So, we need to find a way to raise personal income. What faster and more effective way to raise personal income than through a tax rebate? Not only are tax rebates instantly effective, but they are fair since all taxpayers receive the exact same tax rebate. They are not targeted, discriminatory stimulus, as was the 2009 800 billion Obama stimulus, which unfairly benefited only certain categories of taxpayers, specifically new home buyers, buyers of fuel efficient cars, certain infrastructure companies, and state and local employees. Most taxpayers received not even a dime from the Obama stimulus plan which unsurprisingly was not very effective since it didn't benefit citizens most in need of help, apart from being discriminatory and therefore unfair. By the way, had the 2009 Obama stimulus consisted exclusively of a tax rebate, each and every taxpayer would have received a $5,000 check from the U.S. Treasury. Households with two taxpayers would have received two checks, totaling $10,000. Such a rebate would not only have immediately stimulated the economy, but it would have stopped the housing crisis in its tracks, as households in financial difficulty would have suddenly had the means to keep current on their mortgages. Today we would need a $2,000 to $3,000 tax rebate to sufficiently increase personal income and spending in order to get the economy rolling again and the real unemployment rate down substantially. The real unemployment rate is currently around 9%, which explains the high level of civil dissatisfaction. So what are we waiting for? The reason is most economists and conservative politicians would object that tax rebates being financed through newly issued treasury bonds would increase our already enormous national debt and the burden of that debt would be shouldered by our children and grandchildren. But what if tax rebates were not financed through newly issued treasury bonds, as has been the norm, rather were implemented directly by the Federal Reserve sending checks directly to citizens. There would be no increase in outstanding treasury debt since the rebates would result from printed money by the Fed unrelated to any borrowing by the treasury. Furthermore, with the tax rebates stimulating the economy, the budget deficits would shrink cyclically since unemployment and welfare benefits would decrease while tax revenues would increase. But wouldn't the printed money rebates be inflationary, as most economists would warn? Not so long as the tax rebates were properly calibrated so as not to be excessive, that is, so as not to cause excess aggregate demand, the situation of too much money chasing too few goods. In fact, we have had over $3 trillion of printed money through the Federal Reserve's QE to finance the budget deficits after the 2008-2009 recession. Yet, we have had no increase in inflation, which remains at historic lows, precisely because that QE has not increased aggregate demand to the point where it exceeds supply. You can visualize excess aggregate demand producing inflation if you think of a bathtub representing the total capacity of the economy and water representing money held by consumers. If there is too much water in the bathtub, it will overflow. That overflow represents inflation. For a good bath, you need a bathtub almost completely full of water, but not so much that it overflows. It's the same with the economy. For a good economy, you need it to be full of money, but not too full of money, otherwise you'd get inflation. So, with a properly calculated tax rebate direct from the Fed, you would have a win-win with only good consequences. The economy recovers thanks to increased personal income and personal spending, unemployment and poverty decrease, and the budget deficit decreases with a cyclical upturn, all without inflation and without increasing the national debt.
What's wrong with that? Sounds too easy? Sounds too good to be true? It is indeed easy, but it's not too good to be true. It really works. To make the printed money tax rebate more palatable to conventional economists, instead of being directly paid by the Fed, some would call that helicopter money, as if the Fed dropped $100 bills over cities, it could be paid by the IRS, as has been done in the past, most recently in 2006 under the Bush administration, in the modest amount of $600 per taxpayer, and traditionally funded through newly issued U.S. Treasury bonds. But wouldn't that increase the budget deficit and the national debt? Not if QE was used. That is, if the Federal Reserve itself purchased the newly issued Treasury bonds with freshly printed money and held them to maturity. How is that? The Federal Reserve is a government agency and it annually returns to the Treasury whatever interest it earns on its Treasury bond holdings. And whenever, whenever its Treasury bond holdings mature, the Fed returns the capital repayment to the Treasury. So, Treasury bonds purchased and held to maturity by the Fed cost the Treasury absolutely nothing in terms of interest cost or capital cost. As already suggested, today we need a $2,000 to $3,000 tax rebate to immediately increase personal income and spending in order to get the economy rolling again and the real unemployment rate down substantially. The national debt would not be increased by one penny with the rebate paid out directly by the Federal Reserve or through QE financing of newly issued Treasury bonds. And the budget deficit would shrink thanks to the economic recovery. Unfortunately, the Federal Reserve and the European and Japanese central banks have been going down the wrong path with a terribly misguided policy of ultra-low and even negative interest rates. The flawed rationale being to have increased spending through increased borrowing. That policy has been ineffective to stimulate consumer spending due to the highly indebted, weak, and risk-averse economy, which constrains consumer borrowing and bank lending. Furthermore, that policy is actually counterproductive by reducing interest income, a very important component of personal income. And beyond being of unfair to savers, the Fed's ultra-low interest rate policy has serious side effects on the banking and, and insurance sectors. Obviously, with QE finance tax rebates as the standard economic stimulus policy, there would never be an ultra-low interest rate policy. So, it turns out that George McGovern's idea of putting money directly in consumers' pockets in order to stimulate a weak economy with excess capacity and high unemployment was not nonsense. Unfortunately for McGovern, back in 1972, he had never heard of QE financing and could not intellectually defend his proposal, having only a rudimentary knowledge of economics. If he had heard of QE and fully understood its nature, and had he framed the $1,000 promise as a tax rebate, a perfectly acceptable concept, instead of as a handout with its negative connotation, he probably would have been convincing. While not yet understood by our economic policymakers and the economics profession, tax rebates are by far the best solution when done at the right time and in the proper amount, financed by the Federal Reserve either directly or through QE. Today, we need a $2,000 to $3,000 tax rebate in order to get the economy rolling again. But most importantly, tax rebates paid by the Fed directly or financed through QE should become the standard economic stimulus tool. How would that work? Whenever the real unemployment rate rises above 5%, the Fed, together with the President and Congressional leaders, would immediately calculate how much of a tax rebate is needed to get the real unemployment rate back down to the full employment rate. Long recessions and high unemployment would be prevented forever. Just think of it. Having that standard economic stimulus policy, especially when combined with a well-educated population, would ensure sustained, practically uninterrupted economic and social prosperity and the virtual elimination of poverty and crime. Furthermore, once the nature and implica implications of QE are fully understood, the widespread hysteria raised by our enormous federal debt will be put to rest. In fact, 
Since all treasury bonds held by the Fed are not real debt, but rather virtual debt, which expires at no cost whatsoever, we actually have no federal debt problem at all. The federal government is not drowning in debt contrary to superficial appearances and the alarm bells of many economists and conservative politicians. Those same alarm bells were ringing in the early 1930s and the misguided economic policy response was austerity, that is, raising taxes and cutting government spending, which caused the Great Depression. The Eurozone has been making the exact same policy mistake over the past five years. Poor Italy, poor France, poor Spain, poor Portugal, and especially poor Greece, all suffering from record high unemployment from 11% up to 30%, with youth unemployment up to 45%. Evidently, the European Central Bank's economists have not learned from history. So, the big question today is, when will American and European economic policymakers and the economics profession finally see the light? Thank you for your attention.